In this lecture, we're gonna cover drugs used for hyperlipidemia. So let's get right into it. Hyperlipidemia simply is a disorder in which there are abnormally elevated levels of fat particles in the blood known as lipids. These lipids can adhere to the walls of the arteries and restrict blood flow, which in turn creates significant risk of heart attack and stroke. There are three major lipids in the blood, namely cholesterol, triglycerides and phospholipids. Now cholesterol is necessary for the synthesis of bile acid, steroid hormones and to maintain the integrity of cell membranes. Triglycerides are composed of glycerol and three fatty acids, which serve as an important source of energy that can be stored throughout the body. And lastly, phospholipids are a major component of all cell membranes and function as an emulsifiers. Now, because these lipids are insoluble in blood plasma, they have to be transported throughout the body in a protein capsule known as lipoprotein. Lipoproteins consist of a hydrophobic core made of cholesterol and triglycerides surrounded by a hydrophilic shell made of phospholipids and apolipoproteins. These apolipoproteins are specialized proteins that can control enzymes in lipoprotein metabolism and serve as ligands for lipoprotein receptors. Now, depending on the variation in lipid and apolipoprotein composition, as well as their density, lipoproteins can be divided into four major types, that is chylomicrons, very low density lipoprotein, VLDL for short, low density lipoprotein, LDL for short, and high density lipoprotein, HDL for short. Now chylomicrons are produced in the gut from dietary lipids and are composed mostly of triglycerides and relatively small amount of cholesterol. Next, VLDLs are produced in the liver and are composed primarily of triglycerides and some cholesterol in the amount relatively larger in comparison to chylomicrons. Now the function of these two lipoproteins is to deliver energy-rich triglycerides to cells throughout the body. Once they are secreted into the bloodstream, the enzyme located on the capillary walls called lipoprotein lipase releases the fatty acids which are then taken up by the tissues. As the triglyceride content decreases, the VLDL gets transformed into LDL, which now contains relatively higher percentage of cholesterol. The function of LDL is simply to deliver this cholesterol to cells, where it's used for cell membrane and synthesis of steroid hormones. However, more than half of the circulating LDL is eventually taken up by the liver, which uses cholesterol to synthesize bile acids. And as you may already know, bile acids are necessary for normal digestion and absorption of fats and fat-soluble vitamins in the small intestine. Lastly, excess cholesterol from the peripheral cells is transported back to the liver by HDL. HDL is composed mainly of protein with small amount of lipids, and it is produced in the liver and small intestine. Now the problem arises when we have abnormally high levels of LDL cholesterol, which can accumulate in the innermost layer of the artery wall and lead to formation of atherosclerotic lesions. This is why LDL is often referred to as bad cholesterol. Now HDL on the other hand prevents formation of atherosclerotic lesions by removing cholesterol as well as suppressing LDL oxidation and vascular inflammation. This is why HDL is often referred to as a good cholesterol so abnormally low levels of it can also contribute to atherosclerosis. Now, there are several major classes of lipid-lowering drugs. So first, we have HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, commonly known as statins. In order to better understand how these agents work, we need to take a closer look at the liver cell. This is where HMG-CoA reductase enzyme converts HMG-CoA into mevalonic acid, which is a cholesterol precursor. This is a rate-limiting step, so by inhibiting this enzyme, statins effectively reduce concentration of cholesterol within the liver cell. 
Now, liver cells sense the reduced levels of cholesterol production and begin to compensate by synthesizing more LDL receptors, which in turn bind an internalized LDL that's circulating in the blood. Additionally, low intracellular cholesterol levels lead to decreased secretion of VLDL, which also contributes to lowering of triglyceride levels. Lastly, statins may also increase HDL levels by a few different mechanisms that are still being investigated. Examples of drugs that belong to this class are atorvastatin, fluvastatin, lovastatin, pravastatin, rosuvastatin, and simvastatin. Now, when it comes to side effects, because statins are metabolized in the liver, they may elevate liver enzymes and thus increase risk of liver toxicity in susceptible patients. Secondly, use of statins has been associated with muscle-related problems or myopathy, and in rare cases, rhabdomyolysis, that is destruction of skeletal muscle. The mechanism behind that is still being investigated, however, it is thought to be related to the inhibition of, of mevalonate production, which happens to be a central precursor to other compounds that are important to maintain the integrity of muscle cells. Now, let's move on to the next group of lipid-lowering drugs, which includes only one agent, that is nicotinic acid, commonly known as niacin. So, unlike statins, niacin works in adipose tissue, where it inhibits enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase, which is responsible for breakdown of triglycerides to free fatty acids. Now, normally, liver uses these free fatty acids to make its own triglycerides, which then become important component of VLDL. So by reducing levels of free fatty acids available for transport to the liver, niacin effectively decreases hepatic VLDL synthesis, which in turn leads to decreased levels of LDL. Furthermore, niacin increases HDL levels by a few different mechanisms that are still being investigated. Now, when it comes to side effects, one of the most common one is flushing caused by niacin-induced prostaglandin release, which results in cutaneous vasodilation. Next, niacin can compete with uric acid for excretion by the kidney, which can increase risk of hyperuricemia and gout. Lastly, at large enough doses, niacin may also cause liver toxicity. Now, let's move on to another group of lipid-lowering drugs, that is, fibrates. So, fibrates work primarily by activating nuclear transcription receptor called peroxisome proliferator activated receptor alpha, or PPAR-alpha for short. PPAR-alpha is found in metabolically active tissues, such as liver and adipose tissue. The binding of fibrates to PPAR-alpha induces activation or inhibition of certain genes that code for proteins involved in lipid metabolism. One of the main effects induced by fibrates is increased expression of lipoprotein lipase, which in turn increases the removal of triglycerides from circulation and their breakdown to fatty acids. Furthermore, fibrates decrease expression of protein called APOC3, which inhibits lipoprotein lipase activity. And lastly, fibrates also increase expression of proteins APOA1 and APOA2, which are a major component of HDL, thus leading to increase in its concentrations. Drugs that belong to this class include phenofibrate and gemfibrozil. Now, when it comes to side effects, the most common ones are GI disturbances. Additionally, just like with statins, myopathy and rhabdomyolysis have been reported, particularly in patients with impaired renal function. The precise mechanism of myotoxicity is still yet to be determined, however, it is thought to be multifactorial. Lastly, because fibrates increase the cholesterol content of bile, they can increase risk of gallstone formation. Now, let's move on to the next group of lipid-lowering drugs, that is bile acid sequestrants. So, as you already know, bile acids are produced in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and they're excreted into the gut, where they facilitate digestion and absorption of lipids. Now, bile acid sequestrants basically serve as anion exchange resins that bind negatively charged bile acids and salts in the small intestine. The formation of this insoluble complex prevents the reabsorption of bile acids 
and thus leads to their excretion. This increase in bile acids excretion in turn creates increased demand for their production. Since bile acids are made from cholesterol, liver cells increase their number of LDL receptors to bring in more LDL cholesterol in order to meet this new demand. So the end result is decreased levels of circulating LDL. Examples of drugs that belong to this class are colosevalam, cholestepol, and cholestyramine. Now, side effects are limited to the GI tract, so bloating, indigestion, constipation, and nausea are quite common. Additionally, these agents may decrease absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, and they also have potential to form insoluble complexes with other drugs, thus interfering with their absorption. Now, let's move on to another group of lipid-lowering drugs, that is cholesterol absorption inhibitors. In order to understand how cholesterol absorption inhibitor works, it's important to understand the basic mechanism of cholesterol absorption in small intestine. So, free cholesterol that comes either from bile or dietary sources first binds to protein abbreviated NPC1L1, which is located in the plasma membrane of cells known as enterocytes that line the intestinal walls. This binding then triggers endocytosis, which utilizes protein complex called clathrin AP2 that works on the cell membrane to internalize the cholesterol cargo. Upon endocytosis, the cholesterol is released and the NPC1L1 returns back to the plasma membrane. Now, the cholesterol absorption inhibitor simply binds to NPC1L1 and inhibits its ability to interact with clathrin AP2 complex that is necessary for endocytosis. This leads to decreased delivery of intestinal cholesterol to the liver, which in turn causes decrease in hepatic cholesterol levels and ultimately increased clearance of LDL cholesterol from the circulation. Currently, the only drug that belongs to this class is ezetimibe. The side effects of ezetimibe are few and mild, which makes it a good choice for patients intolerant or unresponsive to statins. Now let's move on to the next group of lipid-lowering drugs, that is PCSK9 inhibitors. So PCSK9 is an abbreviated name of enzyme circulating in the blood that binds to LDL receptors on the surface of liver cells and promotes their degradation. In other words, the activity of PCSK9 reduces the removal of LDL from the circulation. Now, the PCSK9 inhibitors are monoclonal antibodies that bind to and inactivate PCSK9. In the absence of PCSK9, there is more LDL receptors available to bind and clear LDL from the circulation, leading to decreased levels of LDL cholesterol. Examples of drugs that belong to this group include evolocumab and alirocumab. Some of the side effects that have been reported with these agents are injection site reactions, flu-like symptoms, and some neurocognitive problems. Now, before we end, I wanted to briefly discuss the last major group of lipid-lowering drugs, that is, omega-3 fatty acids. So, omega-3 fatty acids are used primarily for their triglyceride-lowering effects, which are thought to be caused by inhibition of VLDL and triglyceride synthesis in the liver. The agents that fall into this class are the components of omega-3 fatty acids, called docosahexanoic acid and acosapentanoic acid, DHA and EPA for short, as well as omega-3 derivative, icosapentethyl. The most common side effects associated with these agents are GI disturbances, such as abdominal pain, nausea and diarrhea, as well as fishy aftertaste with fish-derived omega-3s. Lastly, at high enough doses, there appears to be some increased risk of bleeding. And with that, I wanted to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and as always, stay tuned for more.